Hi, I'm Rebecca Valcarcel. Let's take a look at Facing It, a poem by Yusuf Komenyaka. This poem takes place at the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., and I have been there, and it's very moving. It's a long, low wall of granite. When you get up close to it, you find that it's not that low. It's actually taller than I am. And the names of all the soldiers who died are listed. So it's many, many, many names. And the surface is reflective because it's a polished stone. And as you walk toward it, you can see your own reflection. And the poem plays with that reflection all through, especially toward the end. The reflected images are what we're being told about. Now the person who tells the poem, we call this person the speaker, the speaker of the poem talks about standing at the war memorial and he himself is a war veteran. So he went to Vietnam himself and is here to look at the names of comrades who died and just experience the memorial as a veteran. So here it is, facing it. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it. No tears. I'm stone. I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. Now let's stop in the middle here. We learn that the speaker is black. He says, my black face fades. And you notice that face and fades have both that A sound, nice attention to sound right off. My black face fades, hiding inside, and we have I, I sound, the black granite. So we understand that the war memorial is made out of granite and that it's this black color. And then he says to himself, I said I wouldn't. He doesn't want to cry. So he says, I said I wouldn't, damn it. And then he tells us what he said he wouldn't. No tears. So he's made this decision. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But when he's actually there, it's hard not to cry because it brings it back, right? The memories of serving in the war and the memories of the people that he knew at that time who served with him. Now he says, I'm stone. I'm flesh. And this is all in one line, line five. I'm stone, period. I'm flesh, period. He is both because as he looks into the reflective surface of the memorial, he sees himself and he knows that he is flesh out here, outside the reflection, but he also feels like he is the stone. He's merging with the stone. More than that, emotionally, He's just told himself not to cry, so he's trying to be stone-faced, stony. He's trying to contain his emotions instead of being flesh and as is flesh and blood who feels things and who cries. He's trying to be stoic and stony, trying not to feel and not to cry. Next, my clouded reflection eyes me. So the reflection the eyes in the reflection look back at him like a bird of prey, as if he's the prey and the, the predator is the reflection who's looking at him. The profile of night slanted against morning. So night and morning, we have the opposites, the day and the night. We have the in the stone, out of the stone. So the, the in the stone person is the dark person, in the black granite, looking out at the light person, the morning person. So the profile of night slanted against morning, it's this reflection of his face against the, the sunlight on the granite. And so there's shadow and there's sunlight. It's all about playing with this light. I turn this way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way. I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. 
So here we get more of an explanation of how when I step here, I'm inside the stone, my reflection is there, but if I step over here, the light falls differently and, and I'm not shown in the reflected surface. Depends where you're standing, how you're looking, where the light's coming from, and all that. But it's interesting that he can be part of the memorial this way. I go down the 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own in letters like smoke. So he's following the names down and seeing how many there are, 58,022. That's a lot of people. And he half expects to find his own name listed there. And he says half in smoke because the etching of the letters is gray on the black. So the letters almost look like they're written in smoke. And on top of that, smoke is temporary. And these people's lives were temporary. It's almost like all of our names are written in smoke because we disappear, our lives end. So his own deaths, it seems like he might have died there. He could have died there. Uh, and it'd be interesting if on some kind of alternate reality, he did die there and he would find his own name. Also, part of himself may have died there. Also, he feels connected to the people who did die. He may even have a little survivor's guilt that he didn't die. Now, these are all conjectures here. The text just says, my own, in letters like smoke. I'm building on those details to infer some of his feelings and some of his th thoughts. I touch the name, Andrew Johnson. I see the booby trap's white flash. So Andrew Johnson died next to him with a booby trap. So this Andrew Johnson stepped on the booby trap and this flashed some kind of explosive or a mine and he died. And so that's why his name is here. But the speaker recognizes the name and the name triggers the memory, just like the booby trap was triggered when this man stepped on it or whatever it was. So the name triggers the memory and he relives that moment of seeing the flash of the explosive and the man die. Names shimmer on a woman's blouse, but when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. So again, because of the reflective surface, this woman's blouse is reflected on the surface of the memorial, so the names are on her blouse, it looks like visually, but when she leaves, the names remain. She can leave. They can't leave. She can visit and then go home, but the names stay. The death is permanent. The woman is perhaps emblematic of how we can temporarily remember these veterans who died, but that then we move on with our lives. It also reminds me, just personally, of hearing about Dear John letters, hearing about uh, girlfriends back home breaking up with their soldier boyfriends and sending them letters to Vietnam to announce, okay, I don't love you anymore, I'm breaking up with you. Um, they can go on with their lives. But the soldier is in the war, stuck in the war, can't leave, can't go home, committed to the duty of the, the soldier's duty, the war. So she can walk away, but the soldier can't. Brush strokes flash, a red bird's wings cutting across my stair. So the red bird's wings look like brush strokes on the memorial, as if, you know, little swabs of paint. And wings are nice because wings reference spirituality. Birds fly in the sky, they, they go into the heavens, the way prayer can go into the heavens. Uh, a bird is freedom. It's a more hopeful image right here. The sky, a plane in the sky. So now in the reflection he's noticing the sky, and you can even see an airplane in the reflection. 
And again, we're reminded of the expanse, the freedom of sky. This is a more broadening, opening moment in the poem. Uh, a perspective that's larger, kind of, kind of like we're opening up the lens wider. A white vet's image floats closer to me. Then his pale eyes look through mine. This is interesting because a white-skinned person and this black-skinned person are both veterans. They look in the same location and their eyes are matched on the reflection. So the reflection of the two men cross over and so the eyes are both in the same position, in the same place. So his pale eyes look through mine. I'm a window. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. This is a very tender way to end the poem. Let's go back to the white vet. Uh, he says, I, the speaker, I'm a window. And he, the white vet, has lost his right arm inside the stone. But there's a line break there. So he's lost his right arm. And at first we're thinking this is an injury sustained in war. But then it says inside the stone. So we know that it may just be a, a trick of how the reflection is that he appears to be without a right arm. And then he sees another tricky image. He says, in the black mirror, which is the monument, a woman's trying to erase names. So it seems like she's moving her hand in such a way as to rub out the names, which is a, a wish, you know, a wish that these men hadn't died, the ones that are being erased, you know, as if they would be found alive somewhere maybe. But she's trying to get rid of them. Or that she's trying to rub away memories or rub away the pain of that death. But it turns out that that's not what she's doing. She's not rubbing names. She's brushing a boy's hair, which is a, a gesture that puts us in the future. It's a image of hope, a boy, the next generation, and she's taking care of the next generation. Now, hopefully, the boy will not also you know, go to war and end up with a name on a monument. Someone might read that image as not as hopeful. But I find it to be not sarcastic, but rather genuinely transitioning from the generation on the memorial to the new generation. And the boy may be there because a relative, his name is on that wall, or, or just to experience the history of our nation, this shared history. But his appearance in the scene, I think, is a hopeful one, in image. The future is embodied in him, and that the future is being cared for. And hopefully he will grow up and, and have a, a good life, a better world awaits him. Maybe that world is better because of the service of these men, or maybe it'll be better because of the lessons learned in this war. The ironic sad reading would be that this boy is destined to die in some other war but the the hopeful sweet version would be that that this world is now for him and hopefully he will make good use of it well we could say more about this poem but i hope you enjoyed taking a look at facing it with me and join me for another video